All right. Woo. We're rolling. Oh, my backlit hair is just <laughs> doing things. <laughs> Woo. Summer is upon us. We're girls. certainly in a state of flux, seasonally, Ugh. mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Yeah. So who knows how this is going to go? I mean, we certainly have a lot to talk about. Right. Welcome to episode now six of Slay House Review. The New Yorker has, you know, retreated from their fear of us and decided to confront us with another awful story. And this one truly is awful. So yes. we will be discussing Pulse by Cunning Jones or James. I think it's Jones. I forget. Let me look really quick. Sounds right. Yeah. Um, Conan Jones. Right. So let's let's sort of uh, let's just get into it, and I think we and, can. And you know, because there's not really much plot, I feel that we have to disclose. I will right. say, if anybody's curious, <laughs> um, in anticipation of us not liking a story this week, I s- prepared myself one of the two times spicy bulldog ramen Woo! packets. The last time I ate one of these was a really kind of excruciating experience. So and I have stomach issues, so you know. So she will not be partaking this well, time. Maybe a little. But you know, certainly one of us has to have right. our wits about us as much as possible. So, you know, it is what it is. We'll Although see I'm if I can be hitting hear it. The bong instead. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna you know. we'll be, you know, between realms. All right. right. Anyway. I'll take a bite. Go ahead. Let's just give us okay. give us a rundown. I'll start us in while you take the bite. Yeah. Okay, ready? Absolutely. Slay. So this week's story, um, it's called Pulse. Uh, There are really only, I would say, three central characters and then some peripheral, like, maintenance people in this story. Quite literally, like, maintenance people. Um, Because they're, like, in this, it's like a husband, wife, their baby daughter. They're in sort of, like, a remote or perhaps heavily wooded area in a cabin, uh, which we are told within the first couple paragraphs is, like, leaking. You know, I have been in my fair share of leaky buildings for some situation or another. It was the never mold. disclosed to us how exactly the mechanism of this leak is happening. Like, somehow water is just pouring in. And it's like there's the angle of the rain and something about the slats it's being let in and the ground is wet. In my experience, it's been all basements upwards, but <sighs> so I can't speak to this necessarily. And I will say... This is one of the first in a series of just like symbolic objects that right. are captured within Think this story. Like Chekhov's wet carpet <clears throat> in this situation. And so I would say this story is not exactly a story with a plot, but more so just like no. a man fumbling his way through a series of symbolic objects. And at the end, like his whole yes. family presumably dies. Um, right. Totally. Oh, this um, is very how spicy. How are you doing? I'm I mean, I'm starting to sweat, but friend. it's, you know, it's slang. Checking in on my friend. And so the story starts, just another yeah. significant symbolic gesture to note. He recounts how, like, this big storm reminded him of a few years ago, a neighboring property during a big storm, like, a power line went down and it, like, electrified the entire wet field and all of the cattle just, like, electrified from the insides. They fried. And, like, yeah. and, like, bur- like, like catch on fire and this was like very disgusting to him right like kind of ever present in his psyche throughout the events of this storm which mind you is quite a disturbing image for a number of reasons like one i mean first of all the idea that the ground like suddenly becomes electrified is just you know a scary idea but like I don't know this the way this image is rendered it's like they're getting cooked into burgers out there on the field and it's like kind this guy's fun. clearly kind yeah right capitalist he, yeah he's very like um this image is present in his mind so essentially to get to the main conflict of the story if one could generously call it so mm-hmm. um there is a, st- a power line seems to be like humming and sparking on their property and there's a tree branch that's like caught in it and so the wife gets, you know, kind of like, hey, we should do something about this. I told you this was going to be a problem. Um, and now, look, it's raining. The ground is wet. Like, we are miserable in this in this cabin. And wouldn't you know it, a tree branch is stuck in the power line. And she's also kind of, they're making sort of like vague jabs at each other about right. other things. Like, because of the flooding, like, I don't know what dialogue is attributed to who like that's another thing about this story right. in terms of dialogue it's loosely formatted with without dashes right? yeah yeah i will say that is one thing i've noticed with the new yorker they seem to have a very like loose set of rules this is like really catching up with me oh are you <clears throat> oh 
bless you about formatting dialogue which i've always thought is like fine and like dandy but anyways like um the wife or the husband someone bought sealant for the logs for the log cabin and like one of them like didn't do use the sealant and that's why it's like flooding and then right. the wife is also like looking for candles and she kind of opens up a cabinet and she's like where are all the candles they were just here a couple of days ago i just right. put them and like slams the door so we know there's like you know a storm brewing and there's marital distress but like nothing like you know that's really reached the surface it's all very new yorker and right. understated and passive aggressive as the characters of the new yorker universe tend to behave exactly exactly so you know it's all very sort of pulled back in kind of a <clears throat> weird way by the way this is rendered in you know third person we seem yeah. to be following the an extremely father. close third on the libcock father also i will say the little one like the child i thought had a very unclear age i thought it was like a newborn baby but then it like talks randomly in the middle of the story she goes yeah. what's an arc and the first couple of times right. that i listened to this story right well, that was a weird moment he, he mentions noah's arc because of like of course all the rain coming down and like the parallels but, like, with the farm okay. animals I, do I you have wife... to mention noah's arc anytime in a story it's raining and that i mean is truly my biggest issue with this piece right it's like okay we might as well throw in every little allegorical ass that we can think of when right. it comes to a storm let's just pack it all because in here because you know where we're going with this you all know it's gonna be it's climate fiction but yeah. that's where we're headed which leads to a very narrow set of images which you know which are performed here alert. in the exact way that you would expect like, right a and very they've all proper been writer to do them yeah it's like such which... bullshit it's such a waste of time which I, mean, I, which I get, and it's like, it can be enjoyable the first time you experience a novel kind of, like, set of clearly metaphoric, like, this is only being used as a metaphor. That can be nice if it's, like, refreshing. It's not really refreshing here, yeah, I have to say. Yeah, way that kind of surprises you. Or also done over the course of a novel, I can, where right. other things are going on, I right. can see that being rewarding. But in a short story, where you're supposed to have my attention for, like, at most 20 minutes, I don't care. I'm go my eyes are going to glaze over as they did multiple times while right. reading this. Right. So I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you while no, you were okay. in the middle of the plot recap with the, uh, the child yeah. who speaks. Yeah, I mean, this is a very minor detail, but also another like symbolic image that's noted are like farm animals and the, the child's right. toys. And we get this reflected back in a couple of different ways. But yes, then the child like sort of remarks and goes, what's an arc to yeah. her dad? And because I had to listen to this story, like the it's audio, the weird. New Yorker recording of it, like four times to grasp it. And it was on like my third listen where I was finally like, oh, it was the kid that said this, not the wife. I thought it was I just I totally like, missed it. But it I thought it was a jab sense. at the wife. I was like, wow, we're really leaning in with this wife is a dumb bitch, huh? But, right. you know, he can't funny. even do that. He can't even go full tilt with that. It has to be like the little toddler asking what an arc is. Right. So, so oh my God. are you okay? Yeah, oh, I mean, like, we will, we will be proceeding regardless. Slay. Um, so <sighs> the main, like, sort of crux of the story <sighs> comes in when um, they they get the, he goes up there to cut off a yes. branch. So he decides. Because there's one main branch that's threatening a power line. And right. if the branch falls on the power line, they're scared that their field's going to become electrified and they're all going to be fried alive, much like the hopeless cattle at the beginning of this story. Hint, hint, wink, wink, right. you know, really... Chekhov's Sign posting burger. this for us, yeah. Chekhov's, Chekhov's burger. <laughs> the cows that are <clears throat> ready to become fried. But yeah, so he goes, and his genius idea is to use a metal ladder, um, and hoist it with ropes. It's like he tries to, he keeps it like attached to the tree so it doesn't fall on him with like rope. So he climbs up to the top with an axe or whatever his method. I don't even know. Yeah. Saw whatever. Um, he climbs up a metal ladder onto a tree where on which a branch is like dangerously close to falling into a power line and i was he gets zapped he basically is approaching it with his saw Does he get, yeah i guess that's what it would describe it jumped the current so he's yeah, he up went... there reaching he's not necessarily grounded at this point like thankfully because otherwise he would be immediately like just fried fried off the metal ladder but so he starts sawing um and suddenly he gets like basically like a, a jump of electricity off the wire and he gets kind of fried and i will say to like i guess but he give, doesn't die yeah give this writer some credit 
I did kind of like the rhythmic, rhythmic electrical parts of this story. Jesus Christ, this is so yeah, spicy. I, like, and so, actually, I, I think even, like, like try it. super appropriate for like the the context of being fried from your insides. <laughs> I certainly feel like that's how to, I'm like dizzy. Like I can't see straight. Sorry, I'm gonna hit but the, the other thing that I really enjoyed, and I wish that he would have leaned into even more. And that's uh, my recurring problem with all of these New Yorker stories. It's like. Okay, you're giving us little hints of something that could be a little bit shocking or subversive. Why not just lean fully, put your full pussy into it? It was like how inadequate this man is against the big breath of the tree. This big, thick, uncuttable tree. He's this little tiny man crawling up at. That's where the pulse comes from, too, because it's not just referring to an electrical pulse, but he hears (sighs) with, while he's like electrically glued to the tree, he hears. (laughs) A kind of pulsing, yeah. like aliveness coming from the tree. Like it's like, okay, metaphor alert. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You couldn't. If you haven't been clued in yet, here it is. So, so, so then this he, happens. He sort of like stumbles back in, and his wife is like, "What the fuck is wrong with you, idiot?" And he's like covered in like sticky resin, which, as I'm talking, is kind of sexual. Yeah, I mean, obviously, little... I'm just reading into this. Like this, he was like wrapped around this big fat cock tree oh, and as he's like Stalic. stumbled back to his wife he's like covered in it's like sticky resin calm oh wow that's mm. actually a great point thank you i mean oh as a God. fag i'm just you know always looking for whatever cock i can get my mouth on and whatever wherever i can see it okay. fully crying fully dripping out of every orifice orifice it's, right my now my mouth is like kind of watering my eyes are turning <laughs> up like looking at you eat it like it looks so this is really kind of like I'm a like, bizarre ritual well one thing about me is i'm actually just so empathetic that like looking at you <laughs> looking at you eating spicy food it's like it's really the getting Shane to me Dawson so. empath, yeah. <laughs> like, I can connect with my bestie suffering right. as he eats the bulldog two times. I bet if I was ramen. in another room and they were like, "Is Marco eating spicy ramen right now?" Yes. I'd be, I mean, tears. Are so <laughs> we should try it. You should go cut an onion and yeah. see if I start. Crying. And you would. We're so pussy would. linked like that. Okay. Okay. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so his wife's like, "Okay, you're a fucking moron." They get the they get their real power company out there. Mm-hmm. This scene. Another, you know, heavy-handed introduction of, like, the industrial, the corporate, like, uh, you know, bureaucracy, whatever, um, is introduced. Where we've get, we get the guys from the power company, and they're, like, loosely connected to, like, the city or wherever, the town. And they're like, oh, I could have told you that. <gasps> Low power. What oh, do we shit. do? What do we do? Um, I mean, I guess we could take off our, we could do this without the mics. We could... Oh, will we be able to pause it and then start again? Yeah, I think we can pause it. Yeah, I think yeah, we can just, just put it. them together. Okay, no! <sighs> okay. okay. Oh, and then is the audio started too? It's, uh, yeah, it's still going. Okay. Sorry. Yes, it is. Okay, so we're back up. We'll just have to do some finagling, but that's fine. Where did we, where the fuck did we leave off? I have no idea, really, other than, I mean, so... The power company comes. Yes, okay. Yeah, so... like, I could have told you that that was not a... That that was, like, a live wire. Mm -hmm. You can hear the electricity buzzing. Like, you know, that's... It's, like, live. Yeah. Oh, no, it's fine. We fixed it. But once one tree falls down, you know, you're going to have the rest of them go soon. So you have to take care of the trees, basically, is what they say. And kind of continuing this line of thought about this guy being, like, mega cuck... (laughs) He, like, watches from inside of his, like, flooded cabin as the, like, power guy, like, very capably just climbs up the tree and, like, gets the branch down and does this very cleanly and efficiently. Right. And then, yeah, he comes back in and gives them this whole spiel. Right. And so, at this point, they're like, okay, Slay, um, power company leaves. I guess it's, like, the next day. The time is a little bit... The, the, or it's like, like a yeah, it's like a few days later or something. But yeah. before we jump forward a few days, there's like other like symbolic images that are noted. Like, right. He talks about like, like yes, for one, the trees. If one tree comes down, since they all grew together, together they're all gonna have to come down at once. Exactly. You know, put a pin in that. And there's right. also something Simple. about the ground and 
if the trees come down, then the ground beneath it is also going to, like, go to shit, and, like, the ground is, like, has this weird, like, life of its own. Yeah, it's, like, you know, again, it goes back to his, his, like, sort of earthy undertone. Yeah, like, like the bottom is going to fall out. Right, this character already has, like, this kind of, like, relationship to the environment, which is why he was, you know, he didn't want to cut the trees down in the first place, you know, he's, like, I feel this connection to the environment is sort of supposed to work what we're supposed to take about his character. And then, like, parallel that to his marriage. Like, the right. foundation, the ground is shaky. If the ground right. goes, if the tree goes, all of it's going to go. Right. We're all cattle. So then, yes, we fast forward, uh, like, a few days. The storm has subsided, and he's, like, surrounded by all the, like, right. branches. Um, they, like, bring out, like, a, um, like a wood chipper machine. It took him a few days to get, yeah, like, to a wood chipper. Yeah, up the, you know, the big old branches. <sighs> Then, you know, another storm yeah. happens. They're in the pro- they take care of the one tree, but, you know, of course, there's all the other trees around the power line, whatever. One night, there's a particularly bad storm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, it, I guess both husband and wife are awake, and they're both, like, th- concerned about their daughter, right? So they go to, like, put her in bed or something. Yeah. And, like, they're looking out the window, and the wife's like, oh, it looks like it's going to, you know, take down more trees. And so then he's looking and he's like, no, yeah. And he's like thinking about it and he's like, oh yeah, actually it kind of does look like they're going to come down. So he goes to grab the kid and then the wife starts screaming from the other room. Like they're, they're coming down. They're coming down. He like goes to sleep. Doesn't he for like a second? And he's like awoken by like flashes of lightning and his oh, wife maybe there's screaming. Like a time they go to bed, but like it, it ends up happening. But either way, I mean. And the other thing as well, I just, the other thing that was in my head is while they're, and that's basically the end. I mean, it's like the trees start coming down and then we don't know. And then he's like, oh no, the power line's on the ground. The whole field's electrified and we don't know whether or not they are fried alive, but we can assume as much as they are, or at least I like to, I'm like to imagine that this pitiful, pitiful family has been, you know, completely wiped out and never to be heard from again, thankfully. Other things I would like to note. There is at one point, like, very out of the blue, given how, like, imagery and nature focused this whole story is. There's a moment where the husband says, like, he looks at his wife and she's the most stable thing in this swirling storm. And he misses her. He misses her more than he oh, ever yeah. has mm-hmm. from the distance that's now come between them. And I'm like, yeah, there what was, do I fucking care? There was, yeah, there, there was that particular line, like, it's like, before the very last section, where, in fact, they do, well, whether or not they get fried since the story ends before that, yeah. they do have that final scene together, but right before that, exactly as you say, it's like this really long, drawn-out metaphor about, like, and it's like, it's like calling attention to itself as a metaphor, it's like, uh, yeah, like, the realization that, you know, your family, despite the distance that's come between between us like I wish to close the distance and yeah it's like, okay like honestly if I was you know the editor eh, recommend cutting like I know I just I feel handed. sort of just like general sort of spitefulness towards stories that are written in this way where it's kind of like the author's like guiding me by the hand and saying, here look at this thing it what do you think this means it oh wait now I'll give you some dialogue now do you see how this image before reflects onto this dialogue yeah. between the two characters what do you think of that it like, literally it, it just shows that they um, don't have any trust in the reader because it, it's just like I'm gonna guide you from point A to point B point B to point C like it's like what, do you not think I'm smart enough and to also, put this together, he, New like, Yorker? Do you think, like, I'm going to be so easily fucking impressed by right. this kind of overwrought, like, yarn you're spinning? That's, like, like, the thing. I'm not a fucking, like, junior in high school reading The Great Gatsby for the first time, like, in a in English class. You know, like, 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 like I'm, I'm well beyond this point at 28 years old as a reader. Like, I've yeah. seen it all, and I don't like any of it. Well, and that's the thing that's, like, especially annoying about, like, The New Yorker and this, this whole kind of thing in the first place, right, is it's sort of, like, presented as if it's you're not smart enough to get it and then when you get to the reality of the story you get to the meat of it you're like oh that's it yeah so people is... actually this is like how it functions in a, in a positive way for the their brand it's like people think that they're missing something people think that they didn't get it all i know like, it's, oh, it's, i think oh. i just didn't get it no no girl you've got good instincts you didn't like it you got it, and you didn't like it, so you should trust that, you know? Exactly. And you know what? They're, they're not pulling one over on you, girl. 
And to I quote hope you from earlier. I hope this to be the thesis statement of this podcast. If Actually, anybody yes. listening into this podcast yeah. who isn't necessarily um, a reader themselves, I've right. gotten some comments like that. Like, if you don't like a story, it's not because you're a bad reader. It's because no. the story sucks. Right. And do not ever, for one moment of your life, think any author as decorated as they may right. be is like pulling the wool over your eyes. Because right. I can tell you, they're not. They're not. Writers are dumb, and most of the time, it is complete crapshoot whether or not a story works or not. Right. And if it's not working, it's not working. Or there's a lot That's of people that. who've gotten away with doing making shitty um like narrative moves and have just done it over and over again that it's like becomes their thing like oh, i'm going to turn around a story for a new yorker in a week with my same old one trick pony kind of thing and it's like we've all caught on by now girl like what how and this I hate is it. it's like how old. much longer like, are people going to be applauded simply for doing these gestures and you for know like what I don't demonstrating like, to go back to your point it is actually so like it's so insidious to just like you know, people who aren't in the literary, like, world, too, to make people think, too, that there's something deeper that they're not grasping about a story like yeah, this that's yeah. simple and pared back. It's like, that's not really the case, because if it was a good story, if it was well written... I wouldn't have to think about it And at people all. wouldn't think that they didn't get an aspect, because you could get many aspects of it. The best stories... Everyone can find something within them that they get and they feel like they get. Yes, and, and they it's the feel. combination of all of those that make a good story, right? Your experience reading it is different than my experience, but there's something true about it. These are prescriptive, and in this very, like, did you get the metaphor? Were you paying attention in eighth grade English class? Yeah. It's like... Like, if I have cringe. to do the work, if I'm cringe. reading anything and I have to do the work from not completely having my eyes glaze over, yeah. then... I'm sorry, it's, it's a not a story. good story. It's not good. There are reasons that, like, I feel like sometimes text that's harder to read is, like, pulls you out of it. But, like, it's always ultimately because the passage is, like, a bad passage. Like, it's either not providing you enough, like, visual imagery or it's not advancing the story or it's not, you know, like, there. Th those are, like things that every sentence should be doing, especially in a short story. And I think it just, like, it's insidious to say the word again. Right. It's insidious the way that, like, of course, I immediately forget what I was going to say. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm But it's it. like, you know, I, I just think that, oh, here's what I was going to say. And so it also kind of does this thing where because something is kind of difficult to read, a reader would kind of finish the story and feel proud of themselves for being able to like, will right. their way through it and finish it. And that also gives unneeded depth to, like, right. oh, like, oh, because this story felt difficult to read, it must be this, like, very good, complex piece of fiction that's right. working on many. And so it because I had a hard time grappling with it, that must mean it is this, like, high, lofty piece of fiction. Right. I'm like, no, it just wasn't able to accomplish its goals in the a way that was thing? seamless and, you know evident in itself right. people it wasn't confuse, a total slog totally people confuse that kind of like density with complexity because mm -hmm. i think the best very the good. other thing is i'm not advocating for simple stories i think simple stories are very bo boring and all of this i'm like advocating that like most people are way smarter than the average author like a specialist in the new yorker wants yeah. them to be like for the sake of convenience for a story it's like sorry whoever writes for the new yorker like, sure, readers are lazy, and, like, you can make whatever comment you want about, like, attention spans and TikTok and whatever, but I, I argue, in this essay I will, like, readers are not. Like, people, people are looking for, like, complex connections. People want to make that, and so if you can make it happen, <clears throat> and there's no seams in the work, right? Like, it's, like, it feels, like, easy in a way. Like, that doesn't mean that it has to not be intellectually rigorous. Like, that can still be intellectually rigorous. It just means that the act of reading is immersive enough to keep you interested. Absolutely. And, and at that's the, the end point. of the day, that is what marks right. good fiction or good writing right. in any sense. Right. You're hooked, it's immersive, and it's not a fucking struggle to... Right. You know. Right, so that can be intellectually complex, and it can have a lens with like a ton of yes. different valences. There does not have to be it's this, this exactly this dichotomy between something which right. is engaging, fun, and thrilling to read, or something that is intellectual. Right. If something is good, if a writer is good, it should be doing both at the exactly. same fucking time. Exactly. Oh, we're kind of geniuses. We are kind of cooking we kind of today. Just I know, it. slay. We're gonna have to, like fix the literary world. I will say, um, another thing I want to add, just to you know, 
get on this train of like putting your pussy into it. Right. You know, I really wanted to go further with this cuckolding thing and I wanted that capable power yeah. climber man who came in and just cut off that branch uh-huh. to come in and instead of having, or the, so the, the guy comes in and the cuck is like, oh, do you want like some tea? We can make it on the gas. Like and, tea. and he like takes a, key, a tea with like three sugars and for some reason the cock narrator, well not narrator, but you know, the cock husband sort of rolls his eyes at the fact that the climber takes right. over three sugars. But after he got that cup of tea, I wanted that that power line worker to pull his pants down yeah. and say, all right, which one of you is going to fucking suck me then? Yeah, he did you know? exactly. Just really <laughs> rub it in yeah. to the husband so, what how so. incapable he is. All right, right which right. one of you is going to fucking suck me then? I feel like every time we make one of these uh, uh, like episodes, Ooh, like my what? like... My like sort of taboo sexual desires kind of shine through in the, in the things say. that I want out of these stories. Well, this is why you're a good fiction writer. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Sorry. It's interesting. It's interesting. There's it can be interesting and complex and interesting and simple. The other thing I was gonna say is I think it would be cunt if while that husband was on that tree, he gets like electrocuted to death and dies. The power worker comes, fixes the branch, immediately has sex with his wife and then the oh. rest of the story is about how he takes on the role of father right. and protector of this family in the way that the like, like, man that we had been following who died in the tree was not able to do right. I think I thought that would be cut I thought that would be that would be hilarious well, it would be so and it would be so funny for something like that to run in the New Yorker too could you imagine the like think pieces that would then emerge from it like yeah. the alt-right story that the New Yorker just ran has everybody worried for the future <laughs> of the publication like, n- no, we're just trolling. We're just no. doing a bit of trolling. Right. It's so funny. I mean, because that, well, that does get to, you know, something interesting to talk about here, which I think we were kind of uh, getting at is like, how to do climate fiction well. Yes. How and so. How do we do climate fiction well? I was just going to jump into this because, you know, obviously we talk about the story and then we also discuss the interview that the author does with the New Yorker. And this guy pretty much repeats everything that we had assumed he was trying to accomplish right. in this story and he does make an emphasis on climate fiction he Which, says that i'm a huge fan of climate fiction you sure. are a fan of climate fiction yeah. i personally am not but that's only because what i've seen i don't think has been done well and mm-hmm. this story has not changed my mind and so i think Absolutely. yes let's let's jump into this question of what would be good climate is, fiction i think good climate fiction <clears throat> much like good fiction in general um it's surprising some way right like there has to be something kind of novel about it or like it has to be surprising you can't just you know set up the dominoes and then watch them fall over because that's what (coughs) climate fiction is right it's like look at all of our past wrongs playing out so it's it can become very like linear one kind of single like uh, you know archetypal story because like by design it's about you know mistakes made in the past that are now you know and coming I just, back with returns, like, and I just think it's bizarre because that whole thing, it like truly is like ripe for the picking, and you can right. dig in in many ways to that premise. But right. it seems like every climate fiction story I've had the mispleasure of picking up over the years, and we're exposed to a lot of it as people who are in workshop spaces. Yeah. People love writing climate love fiction. It. This is very in vogue right now. Right. It's just like, why does everybody use these tools in the exact same way, right. in the exact same way that they've been being used since, like, fucking Al Gore rung the alarm bells in, right. like, the year 2000, you know? It's, like, 20 years removed, now, like, deeper into the incoming we climate crisis. More... Like, isn't there, like, a fun, like a different, thrilling way to play into this? Like, isn't there... But it's always, like, big, unshakable force tiny humans who you know all of our lives are rendered um inert compared to just the power of like yes we get it we get it a a three-year-old could tell you that truly right so it's like why and and then that begs the question which is also one that i often have with these kinds of things is like what is the value and i don't mean like necessarily in any kind of like measurable sense but what is the sort of like aesthetic value of having something that is essentially a representation of our reality shit sucks shit's gonna get worse Mm -hmm. what's the value of that if it just reinforces the same exact message it's not it does not add nuance or insight or complicate this question in ways that like and i'm not arguing that like art needs to have a pragmatic or like a utilitarian like use but it should at least have a perspective you know something that is aesthetic value for some yeah like some sort of novel grasp and i just think like oh my god i'm completely losing my train of thought again uh uh, 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 we were talking about he was naming he in the interview yes 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 wait what else but wait i want to say something 
it probably was not even as um, deep of a value, like worth ethical value narratives. Um, whatever. Let's just okay. move on. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, he was saying some like really kind of banal things in the interview about climate fiction as well, which kind right. of does not you know surprise me based on reading this piece. Just about like, oh, it's getting so ridiculous to the point that we're naming storms, and it's like that's not a novel aspect right. of extreme weather. We've We've Always literally been, been naming storms since, what, the, like, national weather. And you said something like, like, oh, this isn't a story about climate change. It's a story because of climate change. And it's like, yes, I Same guess. Thing. But, like, if you, <laughs> if you, if that's the perspective, you can at least, like, I don't know, go a little bit outside of the box here. Right. Right. Like, I want to see this idea pushed. Then, well, actually, here's a good example for you. I read, um, and I actually really enjoyed this uh, last time I read, um, the Children's Bible by Lydia Millet. It's a it's a climate fiction story told from um, like a um, like the collective we. Mm -hmm. It's like mostly there is some I like there is a first person narrator, but it's mostly using like we did this, we did that, and it's about a group of kids who are on vacation with their parents when like climate disaster strikes, and mm -hmm. they just like they just like leave the parents, and they're like they like tell the parents like you're not basically like mature enough to handle what to do to know what to do in this situation mm -hmm. and it's correct because they're like millennial parents are like drunk the whole time yeah. and like just kind of fall apart um which is so see that i loved the story i mean it's like kind of biblically allegorical um in a way that is a little tired but the overall like uh concept kids who tell their parents like okay well if you can't like basically if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen yeah. as it pertains to climate change was really, it was really fresh. It was nice. It was like, I would recommend that actually, you know, if and anyone it, was looking for a It gives me an idea. Like, I, like exactly. Like, I think it would be con if like, yeah, like uh, here's even me spinning my wheels. If a family is like on vacation and a tsunami is about to kill them That's all, like but they have like a is. couple of days and the parents are like, Oh, well, if we're going to die, like, we don't really care about you guys. We're going to go That's party. That's literally like, what it is. Why don't you go? Like, that yeah, is like, exactly what this story is. <laughs> like, yeah, incredible. It's, and it's great. Incredible. Yeah, like, like they right. like, sell their children to child traffickers. And like, we might as well, like, live up our last few days. Right. Like, we're all going to die anyways. You know, fun. Right. And that's what I think. It's like, I truly think... <clears throat> The cuntiest possibility for climate fiction is, like, just have a completely unrelated story about some yes. woman's personal life and what a slut she is and how she has sex. And, like, a whole, like, romance that is spun completely independently of any incoming, that like, climate really crisis. And the end is just that every character is raised to the ground in, like, an earthquake that swallows everything whole unexpectedly <sighs> at the end. The story's not even about climate fiction, but at the end it's, like... An earth shattered <laughs> earthquake has swallowed the entire city that and is... everyone died. I remember that when I was reading so um, interesting. years ago when I was reading The Vacationers by Emma Straub. Have you ever read any of no. Emma Straub? You know, kind of beach read type yeah, author. Yeah. It was such an infuriating book where I hated pretty much every character involved. And at the end, it's like they get, they all get on, it's a family like of multiple generations all going to Mallorca to vacation together and it's like, you know, the exploits right. of their like interwoven personal lives, yada, 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 this, that, and the third, very waspy, very appropriate, right. very New Yorker. And I was just like, at the end I was like, wow, how phenomenal would it be? This would be a five star story if the end like page of this book was the family got into the plane and it quickly crashed into the ocean. There were no survivors. They all died. I would, and after reading that, I would have been like, gag, gag. Thank you. They're all dead. Woo! And I think that's how climate fiction should be done. I mean, my, if I were to write a climate fiction story, that's how I would do it. That's really interestingly, like, realist. Of you exactly. And that's what I think, too, because, like, I don't know. It's like, do we really have to continually moan and bitch over like what we already know to be true like i think it's like and the it, way it's it gonna really, happen is it's just gonna well because because this is the fuck dystopia you know like kind of the big it's like people are making money off this like, yeah people and i don't need to like invoke the like necessarily go too deep into the capitalism rules everything around yeah. me whatever but like um that's actually kind of funny um i feel like it is just like why are we doing this like what are you adding to the conversation and by doing this, are you just like continuing to make this 
more and more of like a tired trope. Like, exactly. Like, it's a cottage it's not, industry at this right. point of people feeling have, good about themselves for writing these sorts of things and right. being woke about the environment and ringing the alarm bells about climate crisis and like, yeah, it's pat like, yourself on the back girl, as much as you fucking want, girl. We've seen it all before. We've seen it for 20 book, years. You know, yeah, I like, get truly. it. Truly. And I'm not even saying you shouldn't do it. Exa- like, I, mean, I have no yes. ethical problems with it, but the question is, what does this add to this huge huge body of literature. Yeah, that's already that built up. This isn't a burgeoning scene. Like, I feel like we have... Right, like, what is this but, adding? you know what? I think that's a fair point that you bring up. I mean, these days, it is kind of hard to be a writer to get any literary fiction published if you can exploit whatever sort of angle you want that makes a New Yorker reader feel sort of rewarded about reading fiction and being, yeah. like, an, an awakened citizen of the world. You might as well slide in and write I the mean, preachiest of preachy right. climate fiction books as you can. You, you better get that book deal girl you ever sell that story collection girl this you know, is the absolutely. exactly like postmodern problem that we have right yeah. like this should actually be the climate fiction short story it should be this it should be a writer exactly. who's trying to write a story and, <laughs> and climate can't keep climate fiction out of the story <laughs> and then or, or he's struggling to write and then as climate disaster unfolds he's like oh yes. my god wait i could make a lot of money doing right, this right now like, and he shifts his gears and sort yeah. of like um, in like in like um um like inauthentically or like with no right. je- sincerity whatsoever, um like writing about how awful this all is and it makes them like millions of dollars and then right. they all die. Right, right, and yeah. then literally they all die. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah, he's like, this that. also reminds me of this conversation of another article I read recently that I brought up to you as well, um like a few weeks ago. That whole thing about how like modern fiction doesn't want to write about money for some reason. It was, right. I think, in... Oh, yeah. It was either on Lit Hub, where this was, like, was. a blog I post. I, I mean, I don't... And I thought that was actually kind of an interesting and compelling observation, because... And yeah. I feel like cause some of our uh, conversation really today does boil down to this, where it's like, I don't know, like, maybe the compelling thing here is, like, acknowledging, like, capitalism and money and I making mean, it about money. I mean, I feel like money is a little bit more thrilling than, I don't know, existential crisis from the environment. I feel like you give... Well, a, yeah, it's actually very and, Victorian. And, and exactly, you know, they were kind of cooking with they gas, were I guess. Always yeah, always talking about money, and it, I mean, it is endlessly. And you know what? People are still fucking, you know, ranting and raving about Victorian writers today. So they were on to something. Right. And I think just like acknowledging like money throughout all of these like bigger sort of philosophical themes that the New Yorker tries to touch upon would at least ground it in like a little bit of like right. seediness because right. you know discussing money always kinds of I feel like kind of brings out like the nastiness in people and it does, oftentimes yeah. all of these stories need some nasty yeah they, that is actually such a good point like because, I'm gonna I mean, start writing more money capitalist realism in fiction. this story yeah exactly in this in this story um he dances around the their like sort of class undertones implied and like the Wales thing, you know, relationship with the UK. Like there's definitely like implied class yeah, tones, and like, but it's not rendered in a way that like it's so heavy handed the other stuff that I'm surprised we're not Exactly exploring and, this angle which could be actually kind compelling, of interesting yeah. and compelling. And yeah, it's like huh? he kind of know. like sort of yeah wisps this possibility right. of social class like this. That is like, so weird. This tough, capable, like power cutter man, right. tree cutter man, compared to these like you know sort of wimpy lib cucks that right. like moved to this forest a few right. years ago. It'd be better for just tiny home. Exactly. Yeah. It would be exact. Yeah. Oh my god! There's so many so... ways to push, push, oh god, push wait, this, this forward. Be, this was in a tiny. Home. In, in, in like a home. storage unit, and then <laughs> the, the lightning zaps it's the tiny home, and that's how they're fried on the yes. inside come on okay i think we've actually been going for yeah. quite a while okay. now so i will say this is firmly my first one out of five story yeah. not a zero out of five because i feel like there was, was a... nice writing from time to time but... yeah and i don't feel like this egregiously pissed me off in a way right. that i think it but it certainly was like of little value right. to me where would you rank it it would i would give it a two um because i actually thoroughly enjoyed discussing it and deciding you know, what makes good fiction versus bad fiction based yeah. on this one litmus test. And, like, that was very fruitful for me. It was. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening so much. Please. Hopefully, like, the audio and the video is not, like, Hopefully completely garbled. Hopefully, like, fucked up or whatever. Um, we'll see you guys see. next week. Do all the podcast stuff. Share, like, I don't Play. know, whatever. Follow on Spotify. Love Play. you. Leave a review on Apple. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>